Welcome, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Renovo Neural, I'd like to welcome you to Neurohistology in Research and Preclinical Drug Development, How Tissue Analysis Can Enhance Experimental Endpoints. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and the moderator for today's event. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First will be Dr. Simon Lunn, PhD, Director of Operations for Renovo Neural Incorporated. And our second presenter will be Robin Avila, PhD, Scientist and Manager of Strategic Alliances for Renovo Neural Incorporated. Welcome, Simon. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, as we get started, thank you for that lovely introduction, Elizabeth. Again, I'm Simon Lunn, and uh, my co-presenter is Robin. Uh, we both have been involved in many aspects of project planning, execution, and data analysis. And we've worked on a wide range of problems that we've answered using our neurohistology pipeline. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a brief introduction into neurohistology. I'm going to take you through some of the key considerations that we think about when approaching a new project. Then I will hand over to Robin, who will take you through two case studies of, of how we use histology to answer some questions about therapeutic intervention and mechanism of action in our neuroprotection and remyelination multiple sclerosis models. Before we'll have a brief summary, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Okay, so at the fundamental core of any study into neurodegenerative disease is a simple question of how do we protect neurons. Histology allows us to visualize these neurons in the context of their microenvironment during disease. Now, the bigger, harder question is what's causing injury and how do we protect against it? We can start to use neurohistology to answer some of these questions during preclinical studies. So first of all, what's happening in your disease model? If you're observing behavioral changes or increases in survival, you may already know the main mechanism of action of your model. But with histology, we can zoom in and look to see if there are areas that are more susceptible to disease than others. The second and third points go hand in hand when you're looking for data to include an IND application. And that is, is my drug having a significant therapeutic impact on disease? And how? What are the mechanisms of action of the drug under physiological conditions? First of all, what I'd like to do is take you through some of the key considerations that we think about to ensure the best a targeted, high-quality histology to meet individual project needs. In general, they fall into one of four categories. Sample handling, the best staining decisions, choosing your region of interest, and then finally, what's the best approach to deal with all the information that you're generating in your histology? Okay, so let's get started with some tissue handling. I'm not going to go through all the pros and cons of the different uh, aspects on this slide, but the old adage of the quality of what you get out of a project really depends on the quality of the tissue going in really is true. Most of the decisions, particularly around the fixation of the tissue, is going to be dictated by the types of uh, stains that you're going to use. For example, for the most part, for tissue, perfusion with 4% PFA will work for the majority of antibodies. However, some tissues such as skin may require less fixation, muscle may not like fixation at all, and then on the flip side of that, if we go towards 3D electron microscopy that we'll touch on a little later, then you're gonna need a lot more stringent fixation which is required to maintain the cellular ultrastructure during processing. Here at Renovo, our main IHC pipeline focuses on generating free-floating sections from PFA to fixed tissue to ensure the best antibody penetration and the cleanest staining. Okay, so now we've 
fixed and sectioned our tissue, the next consideration is to make sure you're choosing the best staining to answer your question. There are many histological stains, such as H&E, silver stain, and Cressel violet, that can give you a lot of information about the health of your tissue. However, when you start to ask questions about what's happening specifically in disease, antibody stains can pick up where histological stains end. In this example here, you can see the comparison of two adjacent sections, uh, one stained with black gold, the other immunostained with PLP that's been developed with DAB to give us a good high contrast quality stain. Now, when we compare these, when we look at the histological stain, we can see there are areas of false negative staining, as well as areas of false positive staining. So it's always important to think about the specific limitations of your stains. So I've showed you a histological stain and an example of a single antibody stain here. But some questions are more about interactions between cells, neurons, and the environment, or even delving intracellularly to look at intracellular components. And for those, moving over to fluorescence to do double or triple immunofluorescent labeling can highlight some of those interactions. Here we have three examples in the left, we have PLP, which is staining myelinated axons, along with uh, JFVP, which is staining for astrocytes. And the second, we have MAP2, that is staining neuronal processes along with synaptofysin, so we can look at synaptic load. And then in our third fluorescent image here, we have bungrotoxin with vesicular acetylcholine transporter in, so that we can assess neuromuscular junction integrities. So what I have shown you here are just some examples of histological stains, single stains, and fluorescent stains. What type of stain, either single day B or fluorescent staining, you use really depends on the specific question you want to ask. All right, so what I'd like to do now is talk for a couple minutes on choosing the correct region of interest to do the staining in. One of the things I'd like to highlight, first of all, here at Renovo, is that we use whole slide imaging to capture our stained tissue. So while we're here we're looking at two individual hemispheres from different brains, when we look at our ROIs and zoom in, we can very easily equate that back to the whole image. What this allows us to do is provide us great consistency in the ROIs that we're using, and it also gives us the flexibility to quickly probe new potential areas of interest. Now, more specifically, on the brain, both these brains have been stained with PLP, and on the left you can see a wild-type animal with really nice amount of myelination throughout the cortex and in the hippocampus. Now on the left, we have an example of our demyelinating uh, model, and you can see clear demyelination within the hippocampus and throughout the cortex. But specifically, when we look at the cortex, there's one specific region that when we look at it, we see there's more PLP loss. And importantly for quantification, brain to brain, this difference is consistent and reproducible. This makes this region of the cortex along with the hippocampus ideal regions of interest to look at remyelination. Okay. So to highlight the ideas around choosing your ROI a little bit more, I'd like to sh further show you our ROI selection within the corpus callosum. Here is an example of a remyelinating corpus callosum where you can see with the arrowheads the myelinated axon showing up as dark little donuts and there's small and larger axons that are myelinated. We've done extensive studies here at Renovo to narrow down the correct ROI that we want to quantify. Here in this upper panel, we have our standard ROI. And in the standard ROI, we have a low count of about 344 myelinated axons within this area. 
Now, animal to animal, we see this level of demyelination is highly consistent. However, if we take a, a region even a few hundred microns more rostrally, that can lead to a larger increase in the amount of myelinated axons that are being counted. So it's important when comparing animal animal group to group that we're always comparing the same ROI. All right, so over the last couple of slides, I really labored the point about choosing your ROI. And the reason is very simple. You can have the best staining in the world, but if you don't understand your region of interest or not consistent in your region of interest, then subsequent quantification can be potentially due to high variability and could drown out any real druggable effects. All right, so now on to the fun part, quantification. Using histology at the gross level, we can get a lot of information in terms of volume volumetric measurements. For example, here you can see serially sectioned brain that's been stained with Cressol violet. It's got an extensive traumatic injury. Using our proprietary image analysis pipeline, we can reconstruct the extent of injury and ex extrapolate estimated lesion volumes. We then compare these between different treatment groups. When it comes to quantifying the staining itself, how you proceed really depends on the question you're asking. If you're asking it, is something turned on question, simple yes or no, such as in this example here, which is IBA1 staining for microglia, you can answer that question quickly without the need for any further quantification. But if the question is how much, like in this example of PLP staining and the remyelinating hippocampus, then an automated quantification may be more suitable and, more, and sensitive enough to detect changes as low as 10 to 20 percent. Here at, the, at Renovo, to answer those questions, we use blinded automated algorithms to analyze our tissue. We generate custom algorithms for each stain. This removes both human error and potential bias as the data is only unblinded after image quantification in QC has been finalized. Now, some stains like this IBA1 stain and the corpus callosum can lead to very dense staining, and that can obscure individual cell counts. So counting those individual cells in this type of staining is essentially impossible. However, there's still information within this image, and you can distinguish objects and uh, quantify staining densities as an area occupied type measure. So here within our demyelinating model, you can see in a wild type, which I don't show here, it has very little IBO1, where in, after the demyelination, we have the massive increase in IBO1. Here, I have an example of an algorithm to count individual cells. You can see in the staining for GST pi, that the, which stains oligodendrocytes in the corpus callosum, you can see that the algorithm is detecting and identifying individual cells based on both shape and intensity. You can get an absolute number of cells in each image that can be presented as a density of the ROI. So here, during the course of demyelination, there's a loss of oligodendrocytes. But how can we take this a step further? What extra information do we have in our images? Here's an example of staining in the human cortex. Here we had a more complex question about neuronal populations. The cell counting algorithm had some additional criteria with respect to shape and size. This analysis allowed us to segregate data based on size thresholds to begin to understand changes in neural populations during disease. What bin of cells is used in the analysis really depends on the specific question that's being asked. Okay, but what if you're not just interested in a single isolated ROI, but more specifically within structure, such as the quantification of TH positive cells in the substantial Nigra and Parkinson's disease? For this, we can turn to sterology. 
Serology is a sampling method for counting cells over a three-dimensional space using two-dimensional images. Briefly, by counting non-overlapping sections at set points throughout tissue, we can ensure even sampling of the whole neuronal population. Here at Renovo, we've been working to incorporate optical dissector serology to address problems of volumetric counting. While this technique allows us to quantify small changes uh, that may not be detectable in a single snapshot of an ROI, it comes with a heavy trade-off in manpower needed to perform the analysis. So if you're expecting a large difference, two-dimensional single ROI analysis may be sufficient for your quantification. Now, if we want to zoom in and look intracellularly, staining can allow us to start to look at histopathological hallmarks of disease. In this example here, we have staining for intracellular aggregates in the CA1 hippocampal region in a Huntington mouse. The joy of intracellular aggregates is they're typically dense bodies of staining that can be segregated out from their individual cell. And we can probe both the number of aggregations, but also the size. But despite the power of IHC, there are some questions that require a higher resolution to pass out answers around axonal health, for example. A technology that we use to answer some of these high resolution problems at Renovo is 3D electron microscopy. This technique gives us the resolution of EM with the capacity to reconstruct individual cells on, or axons where we can get precise measurements and parameters such as mitochondrial volume and then synaptic load. All right, so to wrap this part of the webinar up, today I've taken you through what we consider our key considerations for handling your samples, data capture, and for quantification. Considering all of these steps will greatly increase the quality and consistency of any histological process. All right, so next I'd like to hand over to Robin, where she'll take you through more detail of our MS histology pipeline. Thank you, Simon, and good afternoon. As Simon has mentioned, I will now take you through an example case studies for assessing therapeutic interventions in multiple sclerosis and to answer questions regarding mechanism of action. Before I dive into the case studies, I want to first briefly go over some basic background MS pathology. As some of you may know, MS is a multifactorial disease involving the immune system and CNS tissue. One thought regarding MS disease progression is that the immune system attacks and destroys the myelin that protects and insulates the axon, leading to highly unstable, unmyelinated axons that will eventually undergo degeneration. The confocal image in this slide is a nice representation of an actively demyelinating MS lesion where you can visualize myelin in red and the axons in green. In the image, you can clearly see areas of myelination emerge color yellow and demyelination in green. The area of demyelination leaves axons unstable and will eventually lead to a transected axon or more commonly referred to as an axonal ovoid. Then at the distal end of the transected axon, it will undergo rapid degeneration while the proximal end connected to the neuronal cell, bio cell body survives for some time. Axonal degeneration is the leading cause of neurological decline seen in MS patients. Therefore, the current focus of development of a therapeutic intervention has been targeted to either cre creating an environment for neuroprotection or enhancing remyelination. Today, I'll present you two case studies highlighting therapeutic efficacy for neuroprotection and remyelination and further understanding possible mechanisms of action using histological endpoints. Here at Renovo, we have developed an MS model, mouse model, that recapitulates several features of MS and allows for a platform to study potential therapeutics that can either have a neuroprotective properties or enhance remyelination. 
The model we have developed utilizes cuprazone, a toxicant that causes mature at ligand endocyte cell death to induce demyelination within white and gray matter regions of the brain while not provoking the peripheral immune response. There are two different treatment paradigms that examines neuroprotection and another for examining remyelination that allows us to specifically examine properties of an individual therapeutic. So this schematic for the points of intervention within MS shows different pathological features that start with initial injury, microglia, macrophage, or astrocyte activation, and proceeds to a ligand endocyte cell death and as, re, as a possible result, res, results in myelin loss. Then we come to the major print branching point of the two different models. One is to examine exonal injury and the other for remi, to examine remyelination. During preclinical studies, the different quantifiable histological endpoints can then help us start to understand how a therapeutic impacts the pathway and examines the possible mechanism of action. The first case study will investigate how compound A might protect against axonal injury. In our acute or neuroprotection model, which is a six-week treatment of cuprazone, we observe significant axonal degeneration as a result of myelin loss. In this image of the corpus callosum that is stained with SMI32 shows the appearance of ovoidal staining, as seen in the circles, the typical hallmark of axonal transection. The axonal ovoids can then be quantified and determine if a potential therapeutic has an impact on the protection of axons from axonal transections due to lack of myelin during demyelination. In this paradigm, cuprazone demyelination and a therapeutic treatments are concurrent to determine if the therapeutic can protect axons during this demyelination event. As you can see here, after the staining and quantification of the SMI stained tissue in the corpus callosum, the axonal ovoid is decreased in animals treated with compound A compared to the vehicle or the control, indicating a neuroprotective effect. So from the primary histological readout, compound A treated animals show a decrease in axonal ovoids. Now the question arises is how compound A protect is protecting the axons from transection and what is the possible mechanism of action? Now from here, we can ask a couple of additional questions to delve deeper into the mechanism of action. For example, intervention of either injury, microglia activation, myelin loss, and or axonal health. Conducting some immunohistochemistry you can provide us with information regarding compound A's effect on activation of microglia. As you can see here, when we stained and quantified for microglia, we observed a decrease in microglia activation in animals that were treated with compound A. Next, looking at myelin loss, based how does compound A prevent demyelination from occurring, and to accurately assess for myelin quantification at Renovo, we use one micron sections of epon embedded corpus callosum, and typically in a wild type animal, you observe a dense region of myelinated axons, indicated here in the dark circles or donut shapes. However, the neuroprotection model, we typically observe relatively few myelinated axons as seen in the control image here. When comparing the control with two compound A treated animals, we observe no difference in the extent of demyelination, which can be quantified as you see in the graph below. Going further into the ultrastructure, we utilized 3D EM technology to access axonal health. To examine axonal health, we quantified multiple parameters of mitochondrial health. As you can see within compound A treated animals in red, the unmyelinated axonal mitochondria are increased in length, diameter, and volume. So to summarize and place together all the histological endpoints presented, we can determine the possible mechanism of action. 
So first, the question was general. Does compound A have a neuroprotective capability in our model of neuro neuroprotection? And our answer was yes. Compound A showed a decrease in axonal ovoids in our preliminary assay endpoint. Now we, can, now we can ask the questions of how is compound A protecting axons? And we have answered and highlighted three of these questions. So does it decrease microglia activation? Yes. So what could this mean? Maybe it could mean it creates a favorable environment for unmyelinated axons to survive. The second question we propose, does it prevent demyelination? So no, there was no difference in the density of myelinated axons, and therefore we don't think that it has a direct effect on these mature oligodendrocytes. So then we asked another question, does compound A preserve axonal health? Yes, it possibly does. By increasing the mitochondrial volume, it could relate to the increase in function to protect unmyelinated axons. Overall, the answers for the three questions proposed using histology gives us a larger picture that informs us of the next steps to determine how compound A protects axons. So now coming back to our points of therapeutic intervention in multiple sclerosis. Let's talk about a case study involving the potential therapeutic for remyelination. Using Renovo's six-week remyelination model, we assessed T3 as a potential therapeutic to enhance remyelination. Now, T3 is known to increase OPC differentiation in vitro, and the question proposed was, does T3 have the same effect in vivo? As Simon has mentioned previously, to assess for remyelination, we quantify myelin using PLP immunohistology within the gray and white matter regions. You can see here after the six week treatment of T3 during remyelination, there is around a 15% increase in myelination of the gray matter in the hippocampal regions and also in the cortical regions. Further analysis examining remyelination in the corpus callosum after six weeks treatment with T3 reveals a 30% increase in myelinated axons compared to the control. Now from the primary histological endpoints, T3 treated animals show an increase in remyelination in, in white matter and gray matter regions. Now we can ask, how is T3 increasing remyelination? What are the possible mechanisms of actions? So here we can propose a couple of questions that will delve deeper into our understanding. For example, does T3 promote OPC proliferation and or oligodendrocyte differentiation in vivo like it is known to do in vitro? Or does T3 have other effects in microglia activation or axonal health? Overall, these, three, these questions can be answered his, by histological methods that can lead you to a better understanding of how T3 is promoting remyelination. So I wanted to take a couple minutes to come back to some challenges we might face when examining mechanism of action using histology endpoints. The largest challenge we have noticed in many projects that we have been involved in are, is that the proper region of interest is chosen. The ROI that is chosen can de determine if your therapeutic is having an effect or not. Simon mentioned to you earlier that choosing an ROI in our models of neuroprotection and remyelination is crucial. In this slide, you can see the corpus callosum structure within the mouse brain. Additionally, what you can see are histological images representing rostral and caudal regions. And what you can observe here are different spatial changes in the glial responses to cuprazone demyelination. For example, axonal ovoids in the rostral corpus callosum are greater than what, what is observed in caudal and that there is a differential microglial response between these two regions. 
When conducting analysis, you can clearly see that a good ROI is crucial in our neuroprotection model, and we consistently quantify axonal injury and glial responses rostrally. If you are looking more caudally, the treatment that you are, exam are, are examining would probably not give a clear therapeutic window. So, to summarize what we have gone through in today's webinar, Simon went through a comprehensive overview of how we established a neurohistology pipeline from tissue collection to quantification and how we applied this during preclinical drug studies. Simon also briefly went over how decisions at each step of tissue processing and analysis can impact the overall study outcomes. In the second half, I reviewed two cases utilizing histology to examine therapeutic impact and mechanism of action. The first looked, how, looked at how a compound is having a neuroprotective effect, and the second of how a compound is increasing remyelination and the additional questions you can ask with the, with the analysis. Then I addressed the critical requirements to understand the biology of your model to inform your question and provide reliable and reproducible experimental readouts. The principles and pipeline that we have, dis we have developed for our MS model can also be applied to other neurological diseases. For example, plaque, plaque and tangle formation in Alzheimer's disease can lead to neuronal dysfunction and neuronal loss. What glial responses might give you insight on how neuronal function and loss might be occurring? Although I've talked mostly on our MS model, this slide gives you a snapshot of other projects we have working on, ranging from Huntington's disease, quantifying mutant Huntington aggregates, to Alzheimer's disease, quantifying A beta plaques. We have also completed projects that have ranged from clinical tissues in our ALS studies to rodent tissues in our MS studies. I wanted to thank everyone on Renovo Scientific team that has completed all the data that was shown during our talk today. I hope that you have a better understanding on how you can take histology one step further to investigate mechanism of action for a therapeutic. Thank you for attending the webinar. Now, if there are any questions, we'd like to open it up and have them answered for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Avila and Dr. Lunn. We do have some questions. Our first question, are these techniques applicable for performing histological staining and analysis on tissues other than neurotissue? Yeah, definitely. I, I, you, you can take all of these and apply them to, to different tissues. And, and as I said about fixation, some of those tissues may require uh, a different level of fixation to give you nice, clear histology. But, you know, with, within a study, if you wanted to look at other tissues, the same approaches can be very easily used. All right. What is the role of single cell analysis in neurohistology? So what, what we, we can do with single cell analysis or what you can do is, you know, go into an ultrastructural an um, investigation to determine at that one level, a single cell level, you can look at, you know, differences in morphology and things like that. There's also, I believe, you can do flow analysis um, and those type of sorting experiments. Do you have anything else, Sam? Yes, but I think, I mean, one of the major advantages of uh, histology is the fact that, that you're looking at your, the cells within the context of the microenvironment. I think that's really important to consider. Now, you know, a lot of these things, we're not looking necessarily at a single cell. If you're curious about the specific identification of a cell, you can go a step further and multiplex and, uh, you know, especially like immune type cells, multiplexing with up to like four to five different antibodies in a histoflow type thing would give you more concrete information on identity. But really, I think, you know, looking at, at in, in context is really important. Okay. And we have a question asking, how do you determine your ROI? What are your criteria? 
To determine the region of interest, you really need to understand your question and the biology of the model that you're using to test your question. Um, what we had done um, with the Cooper Zone model was to investigate different areas within the corpus callosum to see the responses to demyelination rostrally and caudally. So what we were able to do um, was to determine what areas were more activated that you would be able to see a therapeutic effect in that specific area. So if you translate it to another model, you could, you know, in, investigate or look into the literature to see if there's any differential uh, spatial differences within your ROI where you're examining a therapeutic effect or if you know your target of your therapeutic, you can investigate where that would have the biggest change within your specific tissue you're looking at. Yeah, and okay. so just, to add, just, just, just to add to that, I think, you know, once you determine that, you know, then that's when we, you know, and you can see those uh, differences, you then need to do a power analysis to make sure anything that you're looking for in terms of therapeutic impact, you have a good enough reliable window to be able to make that observation. Okay, perfect. Okay, what approaches can be used for sorting out cells? This is, so, so this gets us a little bit away from histology per se, if you want to actually sort cells. Now, if you have tissue that is available and you're looking to sort cells, then uh, some really good techniques are laser capture microscopy. That's come a long way recently uh, in terms of being able to isolate specific cell populations. But other than that, you know, you get away from the histology and more into the arena of flow. Uh, if you want to really start to uh, get into actual single cell or a single population dynamics. Okay. Another question. Is there a clear way of distinguishing microglia from macrophages? Yes. Yeah, so this is a question we get a lot. And I can tell you that, you know, you can look at for you know, morphology. Um, there's different, you know, antibody stains that you can do that specifically look at activated microglia or, or macrophages or anything like that. So there are different ways but to do it that way for staining and using different markers. Simon, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think, I think that's, that's about it. Yeah. Okay. How do you know whether there is an inherent problem with drug delivery not associated with the drug itself? That's a good question. You know, one of the things that we do here when we're doing internal, uh, uh, we're doing, doing studies occasionally is to take terminal blood. Uh, now, a lot of times when uh, we're running studies, uh, you know, our clients have already gone through a lot of the PK studies that are required to understand the dynamics of the drug within a system. So, you know, in terms of getting over the blood-brain barrier, what types of concentrations they're seeing. We can check in the blood to see that the, the delivery, you know, has been correct. Uh, the only other way is if you have a very specific target. If you know your drug going to affect AKT signaling or uh, upregulate a particular protein or gene, then you can use that as a marker in histology to uh, look at drug effects. But that's not going to be as sensitive as you do at Western. So if you take tissue, uh, grind it up, run a Western blot, you're going to get a lot more accurate quantification in terms of your drug effects over necessarily histology. All right, and we've had a couple questions come in about staining and fixation. Have you used GFAP staining to probe MS and MS model tissues? And if so, did you see astrogliosis? Yes, we have done GFAP staining in these models. And yes, we do see astrogliosis. Okay, and following <laughs> up to that, <laughs> what's the best method of fixation of mouse spinal cords for histological analysis? usually hematoxylin and eosin and fluorescent antibodies? Yeah, so that's a good question. So for spinal cords, you know, in the past what we typically do 
is a, a 4% perfusion. The thing with spinal cords in our experience is you need to dissect them quickly from the column. So you, you want to make sure that you get good post-fix uh, for a day uh, after it's been removed from the column. If you leave it in the column for its uh, post-fixation, then you don't get as very good uh, permalization uh, in terms of staining. Uh, so it, yes, yeah, so I would say you can do you can do your regular uh, perfusion, but then take it out of the column, do a quick post fix afterwards. Now some of your antibodies, you know, may work differently. So you know, going from a range to two to four percent PFA, you may see some differences there. And to right. um, and to follow up on that, so. It depends sometimes on the actual model that you're using and looking at spinal cord. Sometimes your spinal cord will not be, it will have lesions and things like that. So you need a little bit more support, which means embedding into other tissues, I mean, excuse me, other into different solutions. So that would hold the actual st structure of the, the spinal cord. So sometimes, for example, an EAE, or spinal cord lesion uh, models, we usually tend to embed in OCT or you can do a paraffin or something like that just to hold the integrity of the tissue together. All right. What is the best method of evaluating axonal loss? So in my experience for axonal loss, EM would be the best way because EM, or you could do fluorescence with an, a neuronal stain, for example, an EUN um, or anything like that. EM will give you a higher resolution to, you know, get the smaller axons, uh, unmyelinated axons, to count for your axonal loss. And then fluorescence will give you an overview. But that would be my, my experiences. Simon, did you yeah, have right. any? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think, I think yeah, if, you're, if you're going for actual, actual axonal counts, like uh, doing some sampling by EM is going to give you your most reliable actual quantification in, in terms of axons. Okay, excellent. That appears to be all of our questions. I'd like to thank our two presenters today, Dr. Robin Avila and Dr. Simon Lunn. I'd like to thank Renovo Neural for their very kind sponsorship of today's web symposium. And most of all, I'd like to thank those of you who came and spent some time with us. I hope you got some of the answers to your research questions. Thank you again. I look forward to seeing you all at future CHI web symposia. Have a great day.